Hello, welcome back to Paper Clustering. Today we're going to look at stock preparation. And in the stock prep part of the plant, we'll be uh, asking these questions. How do we disperse the fibres that we buy in? What type of work do we do on fibres? And what equipment do we need to do that work? And finally, in this section, we'll look at how does this work affect the properties of the final sheet? OK, let's start with the type of fibre. Well, essentially there are two types. There are virgin fibres and there are recycled fibre. If you're bringing in virgin fibre, then from the plant to the individual fibre, it could have come by one of two routes, as we saw in an earlier section. It can either have come by the chemical route, where we've dissolved away the lignin and we're left with what we call chemical fibres. Or we could have taken the log, chopped it down into chips, put it through a refiner and literally pulled all those fibres apart uh, in a mechanical way. And therefore we have mechanical fibre. Either of these two fibres, when we bring them into the, uh, into the mill, could come in a, a bleached or an unbleached form. Today, there's more and more emphasis on uh, sustainability and recyclability. So we can also bring in recycled fibre. And again, there are two types. You can bring in waste paper from uh, collections. Um, and there are over 50 different grades of waste paper of that form. Or you can allow another mill to take in the waste paper, take out all the uh, rubbish, take out all the ink, bleach it and sell you DIW, de-inked waste. So those are the type of fibres that we will bring into the uh, into the mill. What do we do with them then? Well, first thing we have to do is to disperse the fibres. And there are a whole range of equipment that can do this job. I've just drawn diagrammatically here two uh, to give you the idea of, of, of the two, of two extremes. So one is a low consistency pulper, as you see there on the left of the screen. You can always tell a low consistency pulper, that yellow line there represents the rotor. So a low consistency pulper has a low profile rotor. And this is a high shear device, uh, very good for um, destroying or breaking up wet strength papers, but it can do some damage to the fibres themselves. The other extreme is a high consistency pulper. You can tell the high consistency pulper because the rotor has a, a peak, it has a high profile. And this is a low shear device. It does much less damage to the fibres, but because it's low shear, it's not really suitable at all for processing any, any uh, products that happen to have some wet strength in them. Those two things are really applicable for uh, dispersing virgin fibres. If you want to disperse secondary fibres, then the typical old-fashioned system was the ragger junker system. With the ragger junker system, you threw a, uh, a rope actually into the dispersing device, and when the bales of waste paper went in, you leave all the wires there, and the wires wrap around the rope creating a tail which is slowly extracted. As more bales go in, more wires wrap around and the tail gets longer so we need to pull it out. So that's the the ragger part of the ragger junker system. The junker system is a, is a little offshoot from the main body where all the uh, heavy particles or heavy lumps of things go, things like coins or you know, substantial bits of metal. Um, and then we separate away the good the fibre that is in there and we put the fibre back into the system and throw away all the, all the heavy metal stuff, the stuff that will do real damage to our plant. Modern recycling mills have abandoned that system now and they use another device called a drum pulper. Drum pulpers are much more gentle, they use gravity and they do a lot less damage to the fibre. Okay, so now we come to the part, work on fibres. What work do we do on fibres? Well, typically fibres are longer than we want them. So one operation that we do is to cut them down. And you see there uh, an example of a fibre being cut into, into three pieces. 
The other thing we do is external fibrillation. Now, here is a sample of rope I've used in many demonstrations before. You may remember I've seen I've shown this in other modules. This would represent, say, the outside layer of a fibre. And what we do with the external fibrillation is we tease out all of these fibres and end up with this sort of structure. So we are increasing surface area. The idea of external fibrillation is to increase surface area. The third operation that we can do on a fibre is internal fibrillation. And again, reach down here. You may remember from an earlier module, my son's lightsaber. So here you see the lightsaber representing the fiber. There's the hole in the middle that's the lumen. And here you see the different walls of the fiber. So in internal fibrillation, we damage the bonding between those walls. And by damaging the bonding, we enable water to go in and make the fiber swell. And also because we damage it, then we flatten the fibre, as you see there on the right hand side of this slide. So we make it swell and we collapse the lumen and flatten it. And you'll see why all this has an impact later on in this module. So that's the work we do on the fibres, but how do we do the work? What do we do the work with? In the beginning, when uh, fibres were made out of uh, textiles, they used a device called uh, a stamp mill, basically giant wooden hammers driven by water wheels. And they would just throw the garments underneath the wheel, underneath the, the hammer and water, put, slush it with water, let the hammers fall on it and crush the fibres. Then they moved on to another device called a, a collar gang, not much different from a, a wheat grinding device, a corn grinding device from medieval times. And eventually we came to the idea of the beater and the beater roll and bed plate as you see there on the right. So there we have a roll. On the roll as you see indicated there, there are some bars. And on the bed plate, a bit underneath, are more bars. So as the roll turns around in the bed plate, the bars come together, the fibres get squashed in between and depending on process conditions, they, they get mainly squashed, and which is the external and internal fibrillation, or they get mainly cut. That was a uh, not, a, pr not a, a continuous process, that was a batch process device. And of course, uh, the trend is everyone wants to move to continuous processing. And so the beta has gone out, and what came in was refiners. And there at the top of the uh, left hand side of the screen, there is a narrow angle conical refiner. So essentially what they've done is taken that roll, made it into a conic, made it into a, from being a, a parallel sided conic uh, roll, they've made it into a conical shape. They've kept the bars there. They've taken that bed plate and wrapped it around that cone. And uh, stock comes in through the narrow end, gets trapped between the two lots of bars. I've not I've not done the, the casing on here just to keep it simple and then out through out through the fat end essentially. So first angle uh, first uh, refiner that was done was a narrow angle refiner and people have found that narrow angle refiners are really better at cutting than they are at fibrillating. A further development was the wide angle conical refiner. So they simply took the narrow angle conical refiner and widened the angle. Again, put it in a casing. There's the bars on the rotor. There would be bars on the casing, which would be here. Again, you feed it from the pointy end. The fibers will travel up here, come out through the, the fat end. And um, they found that these type of refiners were actually better at fibrillating internal and external than they were at cutting. There's been another development since then, and uh, people have gone on to disc refiners. So with disc refiners, you now have two flat discs. Uh, one is, in the case of the uh, one on the left, where you see two discs. This is known as a single disc refiner. 
because there's one surface where all the work gets done. One surface is fixed, the other surface rotates, and so you get the same sort of abrasion. Okay, moving on. We'll look at the actions now. So, why do we cut and why do we fibrillate? Well, you can see here, the square on the left, half a dozen fibres of a particular fibre length. We've not done anything to cut them, and so if that represented the formation of the sheet, what do we see? Well, we see there are areas where there's lots of fibre and areas where there's very little fibre. So it's, it's not a homogeneous sheet. There's areas of high fibre concentrations and areas of low fibre concentrations. If you took a sheet of paper and held it up to the light and saw this high and low uh, fibre density appearance, you'd say this was a very poor formation sheet. Different mills have different words for describing these. It could be flocky, it could be wild. If you take those fibres now and chop them down into much smaller fibres and look at that square there on the right, then you can see everything is distributed much more evenly. So that sheet will have a much better appearance. Next thing is external fibrillation. Why do we do external fibrillation? We do external fibrillation because we want to increase the surface area. Going back to my rope again, if this represented one fibre and that represented another fibre, where the two things cross, there's very little area of contact. So very little bonding ability, so you'll have a weak sheet. If we fibrillate the fibre, external fibrillate, external fibrillate, much more contact area now, so a stronger sheet. Other properties of the paper will change as well. Smoothness, porosity, uh, tear, as examples. And now internal fibrillation. I showed you the lightsaber a few minutes ago. I showed you how the fibre would collapse. And here's a couple of little, a couple of little models. The diagram here on the left represents fibres that have not been fibrillated. So here's my little model made with little bits of dowel. So as you can see, this sheet will have a very rough surface. Look, it's very open and porous and not much area of contact. So this would give you a weak absorbent sheet. Blotting paper perhaps? If we look at this other sample now, if we take the fibre and we internally fibrillate it, we cause the fibre to collapse and flatten. Now look at this. We have a much smoother surface. The caliper has decreased. It's much less porous. So you can go from this may be uh, you know, ultimately uh, tracing paper or greaseproof paper. So you can go all the way from blotting paper to tracing paper by doing nothing else but the mechanical action of a refiner or a beater. Well, that's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, taster session. There's a lot more that I've not included. This is just a taster session. And I look forward to seeing you uh, on one of my formal courses. Thank you for watching and I hope you look at the rest.